Wow. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, we're going to be talking about monitoring Swift tonight or today, uh, this morning. I guess it's so dark in here, it feels like night. Um, my name is Martin Lanner. I'm an engagement manager with Swift Stack. Uh, I deal with a lot of our customers. We do implementations. And uh, the reason I picked this topic was because everyone asks, hey, uh, now that we've got this up and running, how do we actually monitor Swift and make sure that this thing stays up and running and everything? And, uh, and with me, I have Adam Taquam, uh, senior uh, systems engineer, uh, doing most of the pre-sales kind of stuff with the customers. So um, he run into the, pretty much the same questions I get asked all the time when I do implementations. So we'll, um, we've picked up a couple of um, monitoring solutions. Uh, some of these you may be aware of. Uh, some of them you may have used yourselves. And it's just an example. Really, you can use whatever you want, but we thought that these ones were um, interesting and fun to work with, so that's what we did. So we're going to be using uh, the Elk Stack, Elasticsearch, Log Stash, and Kibana, which is the interface, the graphical interface for looking at logs. Um, we are going to uh, have a Zabbix environment that we have loaded up, and we have Prometheus, uh, a newish uh, monitoring system, and it's going to be fronted by Grafana. And uh, in the middle here, of course, is a Swift cluster. It's actually just a single node, and so it's a cluster of disks, and, uh, and that's what we're going to be looking at. So, um, all right, so here's a little bit of an overview of what we're looking at today. Uh, what, do, what are the problems? The problems are, are really the usage intelligence, uh, what is the cluster doing, who is using it, all those kinds of things. Uh, capacity planning, how, how fast is data growing in the cluster, uh, when do we need to add more. Operational health, just sort of system metrics type of stuff, and then audit trails. Um, who did what, when, and maybe why. Uh, background here is that we're basically looking at the logs from the Swift cluster, and we're looking at the system metrics from each individual node in the cluster. Um, we will then dive in a little bit into interpreting the metrics around this, and um, as, an, as a follow-on to that, we'll be doing like thresholds and alerting kind of um, on that. And then We'll talk about the monitoring concepts of what to monitor, how to monitor it, obviously. Uh, and then the methods we are using, um, logging is going to be ELK, is going to be trending and forecasting with uh, Prometheus, and uh, systems monitoring with Zabbix. Um, these are a little bit overlapping, and uh, it's basically pick your poison. Whatever you happen to like better, you choose. And it may not even be one of these. Uh, so. All right, after all, this is just Linux. Um, what would you do if you had a Apache web server that you need to monitor? You would monitor as a Linux machine with potentially some additional Apache uh, log metrics that you're trying to figure out and stuff like that. So it's really not all that different, and uh, you'll see as we go along the, this journey. So. Hopefully, most of you have some knowledge about Swift, but if you don't, I'm just going to run through really quickly what Swift does and what some of the key properties of Swift are. Um, it's a distributed system, many, many nodes, many, many disks, and um, it stores data extremely durably. Um, I have not, to this day, seen Swift lose data anytime. Uh, although people have claimed that it did, but we'll go through that too, and I can show you how we figured out that it didn't lose data, they actually deleted it. Um, Swift does this through, through what's called storage policies. It's either through uh, replica-based, uh, which is by default three replicas in the system, or it's done through uh, erasure coding, which is a newer type of storage policy, but um, it's really interesting. 
Uh, of course, since the, there are lots and lots of different machines and disks, we have no single point of failure, and the, and the system is designed from ground up to be like that. Um, the, there's an even distribution of data in the system, meaning that you can actually throw in a four terabyte drive in your old stuff and six terabyte drives in the new gear. And as you fill up the system and it's 50% full, a two terabyte drive will, uh, sorry, a four terabyte drive will be two terabytes full and a six terabyte drive will be three terabytes full in the same system. So it's kind of smoothing this out. Um, it's really a resilient system. You can do a lot of bad things to it and it will still just continue working. I have seen cases where people have ignored the system to, the, to my last point here you can abuse and, and, and put it through a lot of negligence and it's, it will still run. Um, and the nice thing about that is like, it has all these self-healing capabilities that if a disk dies and, and, or if, a, a, if an object gets corrupted, it will still you know, replicate that out and make sure that there's a third replica of it and so on. So Swift is extremely resilient and uh, very, very, very nice to work with in that sense because really there's no rush to fix problems. You have time to think about how do you need to do this. And um, with that, um, we're going to go through and figure out with you how you can look at the problems that occur and figure out what the problem is and then fix it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam, who's going to talk about the anatomy of the solutions. So as we go through and are looking at a few different types of uh, monitoring solutions for Swift, it might be helpful to keep in mind the four major components that make up any kind of monitoring solution. The agent is just the, the bit that runs on the individual server that's collecting the metrics. And maybe collecting those metrics through uh, the kernel, looking at CPU, memory, or through uh, the network, through the, the network drivers. Or it may be parsing the log, in the case of Logstash, to be able to gather that way. Whatever that methodology is, that's what makes that particular agent unique and uh, is able to expose those metrics then to the aggregation engine. The aggregation engine then takes that, uh, all those metrics that it's getting from all the different servers, bringing them together into a common place. Usually that common place is some type of uh, time series database and makes that available to the visualizer. Now, the way it makes it available, it could be just very simply you can query and, and get metrics within a particular time range, but usually there's additional functions to be able to do things like linear regressions that we're going to see later on uh, to make that a more uh, enhanced experience. The visualizer then, as I uh, kind of already alluded to then, allows you to define graphs and visual elements so that a human being looking at this can see you know, instead of just a, a, a long list of, of uh, metrics, either numbers or log lines, but you can easily visualize what's going on and spot out uh, trends or anomalies in the data really quickly. Then lastly is alerting. Alerting, there's two pieces to that. First is thresholding. Thresholding is defining well, what's normal and what's not. Uh, so if a metric uh, exceeds a particular value called the threshold, then that's when we want to trigger an alert. We want to send, uh, say, an email to an administrator to let them know that uh, things are out of whack. Oh, excuse me, I need water. <laughs> so developing a monitoring strategy. So we can't pick a monitoring solution if we don't know what it is we're trying to do. So the major points of a monitoring strategy are really, really two things. What we want to monitor and uh, why we want to monitor it. And there, uh, I've listed a few. I don't know that this is necessarily an exhaustive list of, of all the different possible forms of monitoring you could have, but I, I think these hits, this hits the major ones. So system utilization, kind of the basic one that we're all familiar with, gathering CPU memory and, and network I.O., but that can also include uh, service-specific metrics, in this case like uh, auditing cycles, replicator timing. We could look at uh, consistency metrics around SWIFT, so all that would fall into that category. Then there's monitoring for performance, trying to see, well, it's not necessarily an error, but are things just starting to slow down? Uh, error monitoring, I have two here, right? Errors and outages, and they, they differ in that errors are looking at 
did the, the user do something that provoked an error response from the service? So uh, are they asking for something that doesn't exist, or is the request malformed, or have they just somehow gotten themselves into a bad state? Which is different from an outage where the service just isn't there anymore. So either the, the entire host is gone, or the service has crashed, or something, uh, some dependent service, something the service needs is gone. Uh, feature usage, so this uh, feature usage and audit trails also kind of go together. Feature usage is saying, uh, well, what's popular in my application, right? With a web app, this is a little easier to see. If you think of, um, let me just take an example. If I have a, a web application that allows users to log in, then they can uh, you know, view certain videos, and then or maybe they can uh, uh, read certain documents, and we see, okay, well, 80% uh, of the traffic is going to the videos, 20% is going to the documents, and so now we can start to make some intelligent decisions about what we need to optimize for based on that information. The audit trail is a little more specific. It's saying, it's, it's not rolling that information up, it's more saying, you know, Bob, a specific user, uh, went and did this specific operation at this specific time. And uh, like Martin was mentioning earlier, you know, people, uh, you know, quote unquote, lose data. You can go back with an audit trail and say, nope, I can see right there, that's exactly where that specific piece of data was uh, removed by this specific user. And, uh, and certainly people who work in regulated environments are, are used to this as well, and uh, being able to have full traceability on your data so you know everybody who's touched it, when they touched it, and, and uh, more or less what happened to it. So once we've identified that with the different uh, forms of monitoring are why it is we're trying to monitor the system and what we want to get out of it, then the life cycle of a metric is uh, you know, obviously measuring the metric itself, reporting on that measurement, and then characterization. Characterization is the process of figuring out what's normal and what isn't, right? setting those thresholds. So um, characterization can be, can be difficult. And it can, it can be difficult in a couple of ways. One, because sometimes metrics don't cooperate. It's not that it's always a three all the time. There could be a significant standard deviation within what's considered normal for a particular metric. But also, any time you get a new version of the software. Again, take, take our, our web application example. Every time engineering drops a new version on you, that could change now uh, what the, the normal, uh, say, re response time is to be able to, to, uh, to start playing one of those videos. So now the characterization has to be redone every time somebody messes with it. Uh, so threshold numbers, then alerting. So that's the, the um, really two pieces, right? Alerting. Uh, identifying when a metric has exceeded that threshold and then defining uh, a method to alert people and defining who it is to be alerted. So usually you have various groups of people that can be alerted via SMS or email or whatever. Root cause analysis. So now once you get an alert, what are you going to do about it? So often the main alert that gets triggered that indicates a problem from the user perspective isn't the metric that actually points to what went wrong. So there's really two classes of metrics there. One I call the canary metric, and that's for a web application is usually response time, looking at the latency uh, that it takes to be able to respond to various different requests from users. But just because that slows down or users start getting a bunch of errors or it's not responding at all, that doesn't probably tell you a whole lot about what the core cause that happened. So, there's an, uh, usually the system utilization metrics are going to be the ones that are going to start pointing down and giving you an idea of where that problem really is and uh, how to resolve it. And then that leads to the last step, which is uh, remediation, which is actually doing something about it, either in an automated fashion or a manual. Sorry. <laughs> So we're looking at three different monitoring packages here today. Um, there's, a, there's really a lot of overlap between the, the different packages, but what makes uh, Elk unique, for example, is that it's looking at log data. So it's uh, going to be both empowered and limited by what information is reported to the logs from various services, in our case, Swift. 
Uh, it's going to be looking at uh, you know who who is it that's uh, accessing data, or what are they accessing? What uh, uh, agents? This uh, since we're looking at user agents, so what uh, platforms are they running? What browser? Uh, all that all that can be helpful in both identifying. Uh, uh, areas to optimize and also uh, with, with diagnosing issues. Uh, triggering on those response codes, like I mentioned, that's going to really be uh, in the realm of ELK because the proxy will be logging uh, every transaction that comes through. So anytime we get a request or response, it'll be there in the log. So that makes this a very appropriate tool for gathering that information in addition to the uh, errors and audit trails kind of follow on in the same way. Prometheus and Zabbix are both agent-based uh, monitoring solutions. They both have agents that run on the machines and are looking at primarily kernel metrics and reporting them back. But they both also have the ability to write additional plugins, extensions to be able to uh, gather service-specific metrics also. But in this case, I, I wanted to, to focus on capacity planning with Prometheus really just for one method, and, and we'll see that later on. Uh, it has a linear regression method that's useful for being able to do forecasting and predicting what's going to happen uh, within some period of time based on what's been happening, uh, which isn't necessarily always true, but <laughs> we'll see that in a moment. And, and then Zabbix for operational health. So that's more the, just the, the traditional utilization of that tool to gather uh, network CPU and memory uh, consumption. So when we're looking at monitoring Swift, there's a few things that really jump out as being the most important things. Because as Martin mentioned, Swift can take a lot of abuse. So, but where, where do we draw the line? Where, where is it that, OK, we, we really can't put this off any longer, and we, we need to, uh, to really take some action? First on the list uh, is clusterful. This is something that we've seen several customers run into because it's, a, it's tricky. And, and I think uh, a, lot, a lot of people don't initially, until it happens to you, people don't really appreciate uh, the importance of it or what exactly it is to be looking out for. Because it's not a matter of just saying, oh, OK, we're going to completely run out of disk space. We're going to go to just zero available uh, uh, space on the file system you know, within some period of time because it, you will actually, your, your cluster will completely fail long before that ever happens. It's almost like kind of flying into the sun. You know, touching the sun it is irrelevant because you have already vaporized before you got there. Uh, <laughs> that's an ad lib for you like that. Um, so, um, so in the case, case of Swift, really, it's about 20%. So once we get to about a 20% margin uh, of available disk space, we need to be really uh, you know, throwing some critical alerts at that time uh, that we need to do something. Because that, that buffer is, is necessary in order to be able to actually do a lot of the resilience and durability mechanisms that exist in Swift. So, so as I say, you had your, your, total, your cluster sitting at 80% utilization, and then you have a couple of disk uh, failures. Now the cluster has to rebalance and put that uh, data somewhere else. You need that buffer to be able to do that. If you get within that, uh, if you get within that buffer zone, and then something like that happens, the cluster needs to be rebalanced, and you run out of date, uh, space to do that rebalance. You're going to have a really bad time. So then, uh, so networking, proxy states, and, and looking at the auditing cycle. So these are really getting down into uh, understanding some of the causes of, of problems that, that uh, can happen in Swift. So one of the main things around networking is really performance. In most clusters, uh, and, and it does depend on a few factors, but most of the time, uh, network bandwidth is going to be your bottleneck for performance. So looking at it from a throughput perspective, you, you can flood or completely saturate uh, a 20 gigabit link through Swift as, without you know, the, the cluster hardly breaking a sweat with a uh, sufficient number of disks anyway. And so watching that and being aware of, of where your current utilization sits versus your total available bandwidth is going to be a very critical indicator to know when you're about to run into some performance problems and maybe even be able to get ahead of that before it happens. Um, so the proxy state, proxy state is uh, that, uh, I was already, kind of already mentioned a bit on the previous slide, but it, it's, 
important because that's the place where all the requests ultimately funnel in from the beginning. And if something's going wrong with the proxy, if it's not responding or it's down or it's slow, none of the services behind it have any chance. So that's, uh, that's why it makes sense for it to be a, uh, a focus of your monitoring uh, strategy. And we mentioned here uh, account replication, container replication. These are cycle times of the workers that are uh, going on in the background. And that can help us to understand if uh, there are uh, insufficient resources being allocated to uh, maintaining consistency in the cluster based on the rate at which we're ingesting data. So if data is coming in faster than we can replicate it across, we would know that by looking at these cycle times increase. So load balancer. So, so this is kind of building on, uh, on what I was talking about earlier more specifically. Because uh, this, this is something that, that Martin and I get asked a lot as well is how do I configure a load balancer for Swift? Because it has to balance load across the different proxy nodes. And, and why? Why do I need a load balancer with storage? That's really weird. You know, it, particularly uh, traditional storage guys will, will ask us that. Because you know, they deploy uh, different block storage uh, systems, that's not an issue. So when we go through that, explain it, then uh, uh, the, the, the first line of the, uh, back up. The first thing uh, by default that most load balancers are going to do in order to be able to determine that they're sending load to valid proxies is going to be to just ping those hosts. And that really gives you an absolute minimum amount of information. I mean, it tells you uh, whether the host is up or down. That's really all you know based on a ping. So then the next level after that is uh, trying a TCP connection to the target port. So if that port was at 80 or 443, then uh, actually having the load balancer try that, see if the, the service is accepting connections on that port, that gives you more information. At least you know that the host is up or down, and you know if the service is up or down. Beyond that, you can have a specific health check URL that will do more uh, checking on the back end to ensure not only is the service up, but it's actually in a good state to be able to service requests. In the case of Swift, uh, there is a health check middleware that you can install that will give you that health check URL. And it's also used for an interesting uh, kind of a, a side purpose, which is for doing rolling upgrades. So uh, we'll just kind of walk through the workflow really quickly. So if we're going to do a, a rolling upgrade of the Swift software across, say, three uh, nodes that are running a uh, proxy account container object on them, then we could uh, set the proxy in a state, this, in this case through uh, creating a particular file in a particular location that will cause that health check URL to return failure. When that returns failure back to the load balancer, load balancer says, oh, that, that proxy isn't in a good state to handle requests, so I'm going to remove it from the pool. And once it does that, then the second thing we can do is watch for all of the uh, pending transactions for them to flush out of the proxy and complete. Once the proxy is completely idle, perform the upgrade of the software, remove the file that was causing the health check to fail, then as the load balancer continues to ping that failed host, it'll see, oh, now it's back and, and working again, and it'll redirect traffic back to that host, and then we rinse and repeat for the other proxies and, and perform a rolling upgrade in that way. So it's sort of a, a clever way to leverage the, the monitoring uh, infrastructure to do a rolling upgrade in a way that doesn't require any specific knowledge about the load balancer or having to interface directly with that load balancer API. So let's uh, let's take a look at this. So um, I failed to mention when we started that underneath here we actually have a little uh, demo environment, and if we have time, we can go into it later and actually run live queries and stuff. Um, but we have picked out a few of these things that we found interesting and wanted to kind of highlight for you. In uh, in this example, we're going to look at audit trails, um, like I mentioned before, and. Uh, here I have made a query in Kibana against the logs, um, and I'm looking at the proxy access log uh, specifically, and I'm looking for anything that has uh, an exe extension on it, and I'm also looking for a delete. And I, um, 
I had uploaded the, as you can see here, uh, if you read the message down at the bottom, you can see that it is the Swift Client 3.0.exe. It was uploaded into the cluster, um, and I then issued a delete from um, the Python Swift Client, the command line tool, on my laptop, and I deleted that, and you can see the exe being highlighted, you can see the delete being highlighted, uh, in the blue highlight up above, that is my IP address, so that's the client that that, um, that call was originating from. And so if, if I would have thought, or someone came to me and said, hey, you know, Swift lost data, and okay, what data did you lose? Oh, I lost this uh, Swift client.exe. I would be able to go in here and having all the different nodes reporting all their Swift logs into uh, to Logstash, um, I could go in here and I can audit the whole thing and say, well, who had that IP address, 109.100? Oh yeah, that was Martin. Well, well, clearly you didn't lose data, you deleted it. Um, so, so that's a really powerful tool and um, we have, we have uh, in our support organization at SwiftStack, because we have so many different uh, clusters that we, we uh, help our customers manage, um, we get this on occasion, like you lost data, and are like, well, I don't think you did actually. Let's take a little deeper look into this. And every single time, this has been the solution. Like, just find that thing in the logs and prove to them that you didn't lose data. You know, Joe or Mary deleted that thing um, on this particular day at this time. Um, so that's really, really powerful. And of course, this is just one example. You can grep or search these logs through uh, Logstash and Elasticsearch. Um, you can do that for anything. Uh, it, you can just keep on reading the message here. You can look for you know, the agent, like Adam uh, said before. You can look at all the, you know, all the different timestamps, how long it took. Um, you can do all kinds of, of cool things about it. Um, I, I also created, uh, if you're familiar with Kibana, I created some visualizations in terms of uh, dashboards. And uh, this is one of the examples of object size distribution. And why did I pick that? Because uh, when we go in and we deploy Swift clusters, one of the, uh, one of the questions that people say is like, oh, hey, uh, I want to tune this so that it's, uh, it works really well for my use case. Okay, great. Um, how, uh, what does your object distribution look like? What's the size of the object and how many of each would you have in a percentage? And usually I get a blank stare back. I'm like, I have no idea. I was like, okay, well, cool. Uh, you know, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna stand up your cluster. We're gonna load stuff into it. And then we're going to uh, try to figure it out. And um, the Elk stack is really good at helping doing that kind of stuff because we can now start looking at what is actually going on, how is it done, and then we can start tuning the cluster based on that. Um, so that's really helpful. Um, another one would be distribution of CRUD operations over time. Um, this, would, this would let you uh, understand a little bit what the workflows look like. Um, you know, when is traffic coming in? Um, and, and what is also the, the, the distribution of those operations? Like, is it predominantly puts, their gets, uh, are they deletes? Uh, you know, most of the time it's not a whole lot of deletes and generally it's just mainly a lot of puts uh, going in and data never ends um, being put into these systems. So, um, so that's, that's some interesting metrics around that you can play around with using Elk. There's obviously just, your imagination is kind of the limit here, what you wanna do. All right, moving over to Zabbix. Um, Zabbix is, you know, kind of a traditional monitoring system. Um, uh, we, have, we have some, uh, we have some agent uh, little scripts they're running and uh, sitting on the each Swift node. We have written a, uh, a Zabbix template that is Swift specific. So in addition to the standard Linux monitoring tools that um, we put on these nodes, we also put this, uh, we apply this Swift template. And 
this is just a long list of it. There's severity um, that is associated with each of these and how it triggers alerts. And um, for example, like you started losing devices. Uh, it's not a big event actually in, in, and when I say device, I mean a disk. Um, it's really not a big event in Swift if you start losing disks. It's, Swift will do this whole uh, self-healing thing behind the scenes. You can just go home if it's Friday afternoon and you know, spend time with your friends and family, whatever, and deal with it on Monday. But at least it's good if you know that this happened, right? So um, the other thing, to Adam's point earlier, is drive utilization. How much data is being, being loaded up on these disks, and when do you need to start getting new, new machines or new disks in? Uh, and then at the bottom of this is uh, you know, the, all the Swift demons, and we're looking to make sure that they're up and running. We're making sure that they are, that they are not exceeding a certain threshold in terms of uh, hours uh, uh, when they're compl completing. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see on the drive utilization, 50% is, is kind of a low value, uh, but it's just a warning. And when you start hitting 85%, it's, uh, it's kind of critical. You need to get new machines in fast, uh, or you may start running into full clusters. So um, this is an agent that we have in a Git repository if you ever want to download it. Um, you can, if you're interested in it, just come up and talk to us afterwards and we can give you the, the link to it. So um, Sabix memory usage, standard Linux metric, really. Um, it's going to bump up. It's usually not a problem. It will eat as much memory as it can. But there are times when just looking at that memory consumption is, is really useful and it can help you troubleshoot what's going on with the system. Uh, so a simple thing there, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, here's, here's an example of exactly what I was talking about earlier, uh, drive utilization. What I did here was, uh, this is a tiny little cluster that has two gig drives. Um, and I just loaded up a ton of data on those two gig drives. And as you can see at the bottom here, I now reached uh, uh, the threshold of going above 50%, which now tells me I need to maybe take some actions. Um, and then I deleted the data, and it's back to, uh, to just an OK status again. And yeah, if you look at the top there, you can see that it's specifically targeting the Paco 1 Swift stack .oss, uh, node. All right, disk I.O. Um, this, is, this is important. A lot of times, um, going back to my example earlier about people wanting to understand what their, their loads look like and so on, um, you, know, you just need to have enough disk I.O. on the cluster, uh, ultimately, to be able to uh, operate at a certain performance level. And if you don't have enough disk, you're not going to have enough I.O., in, in this, this particular uh, screenshot here is from a Swift stack controller. It, it shows you how many IOPS are in the system, how much is being used. Uh, at times, you can become disk bound. Uh, and this would be a helpful thing to look at when you're doing like benchmarking and things like that and going like, well, I've completely saturated the number of disks I have. In order to get better performance, I would need to add more disks as well. So that's another example of that. Um, and object replicator operations, uh, another metric that um, not necessarily showing a problem unless it continues over time. If, uh, if you, for example, take a, you have two racks of, of gear and, and now you put in two more racks of gear and now you start having all this replication of data coming flying over from the two original racks to the, to the uh, two new ones and spreading the data uh, equally over all the disks in the system, you're going to start seeing a lot of uh, replicators going across. And that's perfectly normal. However, if you didn't do that, or if you didn't do any capacity adjustment at all, like for replicators to start moving uh, a lot of data is, is problematic um, if it suddenly happens. It could be uh, something that where you, you could be looking at um, disks suddenly going bad. Now you have many metrics will probably tell you that, but 
that's what's going to happen. If uh, we had one customer that had a, a batch of bad disks and about 30 of them went out in a week, uh, they just pop, 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 and what happens? The replicators start moving data around to protect your data. So it's a great metric to kind of take a look at and understand what it does. And uh, with that, Adam, a little Prometheus here. So as I was mentioning earlier, um, we wanted to look at Prometheus for doing trending and forecasting for one particular function that it provides uh, as part of the aggregation engine. So that's illustrated here. The, uh, the first graph on the top that we're looking at that says available storage capacity, that is uh, really mirroring exactly what you saw before in Zabbix uh, as it's giving you that real-time information about what's, uh, what the available capacity is. Now, for the sake of the demo, uh, this is data from last night. So we had seven gigs of, of uh, avail available storage space, and, and then we just loaded a couple of gigs of data onto the system so that we could show uh, a, a big drop in the, uh, the available space and what that would do to the forecast. So beneath that graph on the bottom is where we see the 24-hour forecast. What that's saying is that what, it, what it's telling us is that if you keep doing what you're doing now, in 24 hours, this is what's going to happen. Now, that, as we all know, that one, that's not necessarily the case. You may not continue doing what you're doing now. And in our case, that's exactly what happened. We had this sudden drop in the available capacity because we loaded data, and then we stopped. There's some, so, I think some administrator just killed a bunch of disks or something in our system there. Yeah, some yeah, administrator yeah, did. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and so, Without a service window or anything. Yeah. So that's another thing that can impact available capacity as well, would be, of course, disk failures uh, is another example. And so, um, so forecasting can be very helpful to give you early warning of uh, potential problems that you're about to run into, but it also is, is certainly prone to error, as it does make an assumption that things will continue being the way that they have been. So, um, so as you're looking at the rows from the bottom, we have the 24-hour forecast being recalculated on an hourly basis. And it's basing that on the previous day's uh, operations in this case, but the only thing it has is really a, a steady state and then that one drop. So we can see how it says, uh, oh, you're gonna be fine, you're gonna be fine, and then, oh my God, we're, you know, the world is coming to an end. But, um, but it's not. So uh, <laughs> going to be the next slide. So then logically the next thing after that is to, uh, to be able to alert when it looks like you know, we're about to run off of a cliff. And I couldn't think of a really great way to demonstrate that uh, in a way that was really effective, but uh, I thought this might be helpful to kind of get an example of exactly how you would configure such a thing in Prometheus and using the alert manager. So I, I promise I didn't just do this to be mean or anything, but I'll, <laughs> I'll take you through it really quick. So it's saying, um, so we have an alert. The alert's called storage critical 24 hours. So that's telling us, okay, if 24 hours keeps going like it has been over the last day, and the next day we're, we're gonna, have, we're gonna be uh, having problems. So how is that defined? It's defined as we're, we're seeing a, a, I'll skip some for a minute and just look at the next method. It's called predict a linear. That's the important one. That's the one that does the linear regression against the previous series of data. So it's doing a, uh, a predict linear on node file system free, so that's just like it sounds, free available space on the file system for a job called, in this case, Swift Stack, but that indicates a node or a group of nodes, so that's the set that we're interested in, and the mount point identifies the drives that we're interested in. So in this case, it's a regular expression match against uh, slash SRV slash node, and that's going to basically give us all of the Swift drives. That will always give you all your Swift drives. And so uh, we're grabbing that uh, and taking in, in the square brackets, you see 1D. So that's saying, look over the last day. That's the data that we're gonna take to be able to make our prediction. And then all of that gets summed. So that's the sum for that prediction across all of the disks that match that regular expression. If that is less than all this other stuff. All the other stuff is just saying 20% of the available space. 
I just, rather than writing that as a constant, I wrote it as a variable so that in case you add capacity to the system, this alert would automatically float and adjust and, and not be locked to that, that constant value. But, um, but it's similar to what we saw before. It's node file system uh, size instead of free for the same job, same mount points, sum together, and then we just multiply by 0.2, it gives us 20%. For one hour, so that is an interesting bit, because one thing um, that can be really, really troublesome and, and aggravating about monitoring, particularly when you have alerts configured, is uh, spikes, just random spikes and outliers in the data. So by uh, specifying for one hour, what I'm saying is that we're gonna reevaluate that expression every five minutes, and the five minutes isn't shown here, that's just based on uh, the server configuration and when, uh, when that particular job was defined. I said we're gonna, we're gonna have a five minute uh, evaluation interval. So if every five minutes we keep evaluating that and we keep getting, this keeps evaluating to true for an entire hour, then we wanna trigger the alert. So we're sure at that point that this isn't just an anomaly, that this is really real and uh, we won't bother somebody with something that we think is, is not true. The labels then just identify uh, the group being storage admin, so that's, uh, like I was saying earlier, we need to know who we need to notify and uh, how, how to notify them. In this case, we're gonna, uh, it's a critical alert. So we could, ha that could either just appear as, you know, the word critical in the subject line of an email, or it may correspond to a actual mode of delivery. It says well, if uh, alerts are critical, then we wanna do SMS, or if they're just warning, then we wanna do email or some other method. And so uh, that brings us to the end. Uh, we have uh, a, so a yeah. demo that we can do if, if uh, are we- I think we're actually kind of running up against we, time Are we out here. on time or we, think, can, or we can answer questions? I think questions. we are, but uh, yeah, if there's any quick questions, um, we'll happy to take them. If Notice we, can, we can't see very well yeah. with the lights, so we're gonna, let's try to. But we can also hang out afterwards outside, and if you have any additional questions, feel free to come up to us and check. Um, we can also set up the, the demo outside and poke around on it and do all kinds of fun stuff if you have time. Does anybody have any questions? Or? Everyone's either a master or they're all completely lost. That's one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Yes.